Okay, well, welcome. Um, hello, I'm Aldis Kalukas, and it's my pleasure to welcome one and all to the 23rd in our What Talk series. Way back in the gloomy depths of the COVID-19 pandemic in April 2020, there was one brilliant silver lining. It marked the first showing in the USA of the PBS documentary, H2O, The Molecule That Made Us. Anyone who saw it will remember the breathtaking images of bonobos gracefully wading bipedally in the shallows of the Congo, gently pushing aside water lilies as they foraged for food from the surface. I, for one, will never forget the words that accompanied that video. And that's what's so wonderful about the wading hypothesis. In the water, you're buoyed up so that the physical stresses are much less. This is a wonderfully ecological argument for how we became bipedal. That's what we come from, a water-walking, wading ape. Now, to say these words were music to my ears would be a gross understatement, as I'd been studying the wading hypothesis for 25 years. The music was all the sweeter, knowing that they came from the mouth of one of the most prominent anthropological primatologists in the world, Richard Wrangham. So you can imagine how thrilled, and I have to say terrified, I am now to be introducing him as our guest speaker today. As most of you will be aware, Richard Wrangham is renowned all over the world for his influential contributions to understanding human evolution and behavior. Serving as a professor at Harvard University, Wrangham's research has centered on primate behavior with a particular focus on chimpanzees, a species with which he has extensive fieldwork experience including many years at the Kibali Chimpanzee Project in Uganda, where he's a co-director. Among Richard's most notable publications is Catching Fire, How Cooking Made Us Human. It proposes a compelling hypothesis that cooking food revolutionized human evolution by making food more easily digestible and energetically rewarding, cooking allowed our ancestors to allocate less time to chewing and foraging, enabling more energy intensive activities like brain development and social interactions. More recently, his focus has shifted to human aggression. In his latest book, The Goodness Paradox, Wrangham makes the fascinating observation that while humans are far less likely than our primate relatives to be individually violent for emotional reasons, we are notorious for organized violence against other groups. Only humans engage in warfare. To explain this phenomenon, uh, Richard explores the intriguing idea that humans are a self-domesticated species that through the development of language learned to effectively manage and control the most savage members of our societies through practices such as capital punishment. These are just two examples of Richard's multifaceted approach to trying to understand the deep-rooted connections between human and primate behavior. Another such connection will be the focus of Richard's talk today, the way we move, which is, of course, bipedally. He will be metaphorically returning to the Congo and those bonobos to discuss why wading makes sense as a forag foraging adaptation in Australopithecines, a putative ancestor of the genus Homo. So without further ado, it is my unbelievable privilege to switch from nine in the evening here in Western Australia to nine in the morning in Boston, Massachusetts, to welcome our esteemed, esteemed guest speaker, Richard Wangham. Goodness, thank you, uh, Algis. That's a wonderful introduction. <clears throat> Can I go home now? <laughs> so if you want to share your screen. All right, well, um, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming. And um, I don't know whether this will be too pedantic, but I just wanted to take the opportunity to make clear the way I think about um, the um, uh, the argument that that wading um, makes sense as a foraging adaptation. But as the slide here says, I don't think it yet, at least, makes sense as a selective pressure for bipedalism. Um, and um, the reason for that is, is what Al just said, which is that um, the uh, the ape that stands up in water is so buoyed that it's not clear that there are sufficient selective pressures to change the quadrupedal locomotion uh, uh, that is um, the way chimpanzees move around 
um, into something um, that is is functionally is evolved to be bipedal. That is to say, you know, the problem that I'm I'm going to end on is if apes can already weigh pretty effectively, then why did they need to change? And so that seems to me to be a problem, an unsolved problem. But um, meanwhile, I do think there's every reason to think that wading would have been important. So th that's the argument I want to make today. And um, so here is Adrian Cortland's rather delightful picture uh, from one of his publications, which um, I think probably exaggerates the uh, extent of diving being important. And, um, and I think gets wrong uh, in a sort of maybe a trivial way uh, the question of of where the uh, primates would have been getting their food from. I don't think they'd be walking in the water, plucking from uh, the top of the water. I think they were getting food from down below. All right, let's 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 have a look at this. Um, <clears throat> so here's my outline um, for, I hope, fairly simple questions. Uh, where did Australopithecine bipedalism come from? Uh, so that's the question of reconstructing the species uh, that was most recently not bipedal. Um, and then why uh, that species moved to a habitat outside the rainforest. Um, what kind of food options there were outside the rainforest for a species that was previously committed to uh, eating uh, rainforest foods. And then uh, pros and cons of wading uh, in, in this argument. Okay, so um, for me, everything starts with the uh, 1984 discovery uh, that shocked everybody that uh, humans are more closely related to chimpanzees and bonobos than gorillas are. Uh, so that uh, genetic evidence has been um, reaffirmed uh, constantly since then. And um, what is so striking about it is it means that humans come from uh, a, a group of species that are very similar to each other. Um, you will find papers that uh, argue that um, knuckle walking might have evolved independently in gorillas uh, from chimpanzees and bonobos. But I think that uh, those are very difficult arguments to sustain. And um, I will just simply say that I'm persuaded by the arguments that gorillas, chimpanzees, and bonobos uh, share a common ancestor uh, back uh, uh, around here, around 10 million years ago, that sort of thing, that would have been very similar to them. That gorillas are basically rather like a, a big chimpanzee. And differences between them can be uh, mostly assigned to differences in body size. Uh, including the degree of sexual dimorphism and so on. And bonobos are a, a derived form of, of chimpanzee. And we know quite a lot about that now. So uh, that means that the common ancestor that gave rise to, uh, that, that was common to humans, bonobos and chimps, I think um, can be thought of as very chimp-like. And we are constantly reminded that uh, it is wrong <clears throat> to say that we evolved from a chimpanzee. Um, but it's only wrong in the sense that we don't know. And I think it's entirely plausible that we did evolve from a chimpanzee. Um, and uh, in other words, that the species that we're looking at there, the last common ancestor, um, was so similar to a chimpanzee that if you put them in a zoo, you would just walk past it and say, yeah, hey, that's a chimp. And one kind of reason for saying that is that there are uh, a number of cases of uh, essential um, stasis or, or long-term evolutionary stability uh, over many years. Um, we're asking for chimpanzees not to have changed much for about six million years. Um, well, uh, we know that that's true in gibbons. You know, here you've got uh, four genera of gibbons uh, the common ancestor of these gibbons uh, goes back to uh, six to eight million years ago here. Um, the fact that all of the gibbons look so similar to each other, I mean, there are some 
minor differences in pelage. Um, and uh, and uh, see a man here a little bit uh, bigger than the other ones. But the essential gibbon biology has changed extraordinarily little in six million years. And so that's just one example of, uh, of evolutionary stasis that I think could very reasonably have applied uh, to chimps. So I think of uh, the last common ancestor of humans um, with the living great apes uh, as being uh, chimp-like. Um, and then that, of course, gave rise to Australopithecines, and, uh, and that gave rise to Homo. So our, our problem uh, about bipedalism is, um, for me, the question of how an Australopithecine arose from a chimp-like uh, species that had been occupying the tropical forest of Africa in the way that chimpanzees do now. Um, and uh, this um, reminder here is a reminder that that uh, both from anatomy and from the trackways, uh, you know, we know uh, we have very good evidence of the Australopithecines being bipedal, um, and that this could have been associated with grasslands, but it did happen before the major expansion of the savannah grasslands. A lot of people talk uh, about the Miocene apes, um, and uh, there are uh, sort of fascinating uh, indications of possible bipedalism in some Miocene apes. So, so that's long before the um, uh, last common ancestor that we're talking about at uh, six to eight million years ago in many cases. Uh, here's a, a very early one, which uh, has not specifically been argued to be bipedal, but um, an erect uh, uh, locomotor, uh, Morotopithecus. Uh, and I, I just want to make the point that uh, these Miocene apes are fascinating as possible convergent um, cases with bipedalism, but that don't seem to me to be interesting in terms of directly understanding bipedalism of, of hominins, uh, because hominins, as I just argued, evolved from um, something that was in the gorilla chimpanzee bonobo mold, uh, and it would have been a knuckle walker. So uh, here's a, a paper from a couple of years ago where uh, a group of European primatologists uh, are making an argument about the importance of Miocene apes. And this slightly confusing figure uh, has on the top part here um, events in Africa uh, going back to uh, about uh, uh, 8 million, or six, yeah, about, about uh, 8 million years ago here, 8 or 10 million years ago. Oops. And then um, what was happening among the Miocene apes? Uh, in uh, uh, Asia and um, Europe, uh, and then previously uh, Africa, is really totally independent of that. We, we can just focus on what was going on in Africa and say, well, what fun to think that something similar might have been going on elsewhere. But it's not directly relevant, in my view, to the evolution of the Australopithecines. So uh, in other words, I follow a sort of fairly classic view of things, um, the common ancestor of chimpanzees and hominins here uh, in the late Miocene uh, gave rise to species that um, probably um, or may well be on the line to Australopithecines, we don't know, Ardipithecus, Aurorin, Sahelanthropus, species that look to have been bipedal, they might well be ancestral to Australopithecines. But um, all of these uh, evolving from um, a, uh, a chimpanzee-like ancestor. Okay, so um, that's my uh, just simple statement about that point, um, that we can ignore the, the Miocene apes when we're thinking about the evolution of Australopithecine bipedalism. So why did the last common ancestor move to a habitat outside the rainforest? 
Well, you know, the big picture is that you're getting a change in habitat, um, which th people think of as, as associated with the evolution of bipedalism. I want to just be explicit about the way that I, I think about this. Um, you know, we know that there's been lots of climate change, and the climate change broadly happens in two kinds of patterns. You know, one is that um, if you go back uh, here a, a long way from uh, not just, uh, you know, the last common ancestor around here, but through the Miocene, Oligocene, the Eocene, back uh, to um, the beginnings of the Cretaceous, the uh, end of the Cretaceous, there has been over, overall a cooling. Uh, so there has overall been a loss of um, the equatorial forests in Africa. And then superimposed on that, there are all sorts of variations in climate which can be traced to uh, astronomical events. If you think about the Earth's axis wobble as astronomical. And so the Milankovitch cycles uh, are cycles due to um, changes in the shape of the Earth's orbit uh, with a period of 100,000 years, uh, the uh, tilt or the obliquity of uh, Earth's axis, and uh, precession, a change in the rotational axis. And these um, systems are well worked out, uh, different periods, and they combine to change uh, the climate on Earth in ways that uh, are complexly cyclical. So in addition to the overall cooling trend uh, during the uh, uh, last, well, you know, 10 million years, uh, among other years, uh, we've got these cycles imposed on that. And the cycles are, are sometimes um, uh, detectable uh, through various kinds of ingenious methods. Um, so here we have uh, evidence uh, from the Miocene uh, of um, um, cycles happening at, at various different levels. So the big point about this is that if we look at African forests today, and here on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, we've got the pattern of um, African forest in West Africa and Central Equatorial Africa, we can say confidently that this is not a stable pattern. Um, and uh, for um, any particular time in the past, uh, you have to go into some detail to find out whether or not there was less forest at that time or more forest at that time. Here is a, a recent example uh, where if we go just back 22,000 years uh, to the last glacial maximum, uh, then the amount of forest was reduced to a few refuges uh, in Central Africa, uh, and uh, then the forest has, has re-expanded here. So this pattern of variation in the amount of forest gives us a ready explanation for how a forest living species can get uh, deposited in uh, an area without any forest. And here is the basic way it works, that uh, during a period of forest expansion, um, the forest would uh, reach up uh, into what we now uh, see as the Sahara Desert, uh, and it would go relatively far south. Then there would be a period of drying and cooling. Well, during the forest expansion, the apes that live in the forest uh, go out and um, live in areas that uh, then later become desert. And they are, become stranded populations of a chimpanzee-like ancestor. And I mention this partly because um, some people get carried away with the notion that there is an east side story where, uh, because there are lots of fossils in, in the Rift Valley uh, on the east side of the uh, African forests, then that's a specific place where uh, you can imagine that a, um, an early Australopithecine might have um, somehow got stranded. This was uh, Adrian Cortland's and Eve Capon's story. But there's no need to, to restrict uh, our thinking about this to any particular geographical area. 
uh, the forest expanded and it contracted. And when it contracted, then you get some populations that are, are stranded um, and most of them would just die. But uh, occasionally one might find itself in an environment in which it is possible to survive. And then the question is, uh, what kind of environment is that and how would they adapt to it? So that's my simple point about the um, uh, lost common ancestor um, being in a habitat outside the rainforest. And then I, I'll go into some specific ideas about that. So the, here's the big thing about um, the food options. I, you, know, you often see people talking about the Australopithecines as if uh, they had a whole range of food options and that they could just go to the seashore and... Um, and find themselves surviving on limpets uh, or other you know, crabs and so on. And I think that Katie Milton was exactly right when um, she emphasized that digestive strategies are phylogenetically very conservative um, and that uh, all of the hominoids uh, are rather similar with their uh, ancestral pattern of digestive kinetics, the, how fast the food moves through the gut, how easy it is to be digested, what kinds of foods can be digested. Um, and, and our basic gut anatomy is uh, it's very similar to uh, apes. It's just greatly reduced uh, in relationship, to, I think, to the fact that we've evolved to eat cooked foods. Uh, here's one example of uh, this. Um, uh, if you go to tropical islands and find uh, some kind of tortoise there, you do not find that the tortoises are relatives of um, the marine turtles. Now, you might think that marine turtles would be able to climb up onto uh, Aldabra or the Galapagos Islands or the Seychelles and uh, start uh, becoming a turtle that eats vegetation. But of course, they can't. They don't. Uh, even though they're swimming around there all the time. They'd have the opportunity to do that, but their digestive strategies are far too conservative to allow them to do that. Um, and it takes the extraordinary uh, chance of a land turtle um, finding itself uh, crossing enormous areas of ocean and landing on a little island to be able to evolve and um, become a... Uh, one of the giant turtles of these uh, isolated islands. So uh, in a similar way, I think you've got to imagine that the apes that live in forest uh, have got to find food similar to those that occurred in the forest if they're going to survive in um, one of these stranded populations. Okay, so uh, the chimps in... Um, Kibali are fairly typical of uh, chimps elsewhere. And we know a lot about uh, chimp diets and um, they are definitely uh, species that need basically every day, uh, close to every day to be able to eat uh, ripe fruits. But uh, ripe fruits are not available uh, throughout the day. And uh, there are all sorts of foods that they use uh, when they can't find uh, ripe fruits. Um, and uh, a striking one in Kibali is the pith uh, of papyrus, uh, one of the world's fastest growing plants. And uh, here we have a chimp going off into a papyrus swamp and, um, and being relying on uh, this food. And the, the leaves and pits that are the fallback foods for chimpanzees are um, not an enormous number. Um, there are uh, maybe a, a couple of dozen species that uh, are the main ones, despite the fact that there's a huge diversity of, of kinds of plants in these forests. And they are the uh, relatively uh, non-toxic, uh, easily digestible forms. Okay, so um, in um, 2013, um, I think it is, um, 
Gogarten and Grein uh, looked at the uh, Okavango Delta in Botswana uh, and said, is it possible uh, that uh, this is the kind of habitat that could have uh, been occupied by Paranthropus boisei? Uh, which was a species that uh, Grein had, had worked on a lot. And a few years earlier, uh, I had suggested that this was exactly the kind of habitat that could rescue a stranded population of um, African ape uh, that had been uh, able to reach it as a result of forest expansion. And then when the forest contracted, uh, was uh, unable to have exactly the same foods as uh, in the forest, but nevertheless sufficiently similar to be able to allow it to survive. And uh, here is the star showing the location of the Okavango Delta. And I, I, I'll focus on the Okavango Delta because we got actually some data about the foods there. Um, but this seems to me to be a reasonable model of how an Australopithecine could um, have evolved, uh, a location in which uh, Australopithecines could have evolved from a chimpanzee-like ancestor after being deposited there by a forest expansion. And uh, it's a, a habitat uh, that has um, a combination of uh, some fruit trees, uh, typically uh, lining the rivers, and then um, vegetation in the wet areas, the permanently wet areas, uh, that is sufficiently similar to what you see in, um, in forests, that it sort of gives a, a transitional um, bridge, as it were, in terms of the diet. Um, and uh, so there is an example uh, that uh, papyrus is, is very common in this area. Uh, with regard to the trees, uh, it so happens that um, a number of the trees are identical to those that occur in habitats that are occupied by chimpanzees. So we know that they're eaten by, by chimps and, or sometimes by humans. And then there are others that are very uh, closely related to species that are eaten by chimps. So uh, there's quite a lot of evidence that uh, this would be um, a good habitat from the point of view of uh, chimps eating fruit for much of the year. Um, savannah baboons occur in the Okavango Delta at very high population density. In fact, in relationship to the rainfall, it's the highest population density of any known population of baboons. Um, and they eat those fruits, um, but they also need fallback foods. And so I just want to look at what those fallback foods are. And um, here you see the, the whole diet recorded by um, Dorothy Cheney, Robert Seyfarth, and Lisa Moskowitz. Um, and they're eating quite a bit of fruit. Um, they're eating foliage. They're eating various other things. And then they're eating this USO, which is um, underground or underwater storage organs. And those underwater storage organs uh, are in black here. So during a dry season uh, for several months, uh, they're relying pretty heavily on the roots of lilies. And you see here the relationship between uh, their preferred foods of fruit and foliage and uh, their use of these underwater storage organs very strong negative relationships. So when they can't find fruit and foliage, then what they're eating is uh, these underwater storage organs, namely um, rhizomes uh, and, and tubers and other kinds of, of roots. Uh, here they are shown in general, and nymphaea is the water lily, and, and that is the particular one, the rhizomes of water lilies. So in other words, the we know excellent data that we um, can see the baboons going into the wet areas and picking up the rhizomes of these water lilies. Um, 
so if you can move this so I can see myself better. There we go. Um, so the um, uh, water-associated plants that are found in the Okavango, um, I've just been talking about the ones that have been eaten by baboons, but it turns out there are a whole bunch of them that are uh, also edible by humans. Um, and um, these, by the way, are a mixture of C3 and C4 plants. So I'm sure you know that C3 and C4 are different um, metabolic processes uh, involved in the initial stages of photosynthesis and can be uh, detected in fossil specimens. Um, and um, uh, C3 plants uh, include um, the sort of typical herbs, but they also include uh, papyrus here um, and uh, other uh, Cyperaceae. And so uh, we know that the diets of the early Australopithecines prior to 3.8 million years ago were mainly C3. And so it's entirely plausible that uh, these were uh, some of these um, wet plants that uh, are now known to be eaten by humans. And then later uh, they eat more C4 and um, people often think of the C4 species of plants as being mostly grasses, but uh, they do include important um, wet country species uh, such as bulrushes here, typha, and uh, some of the water lilies. So uh, the C3, C4 distinction is, um, and, and the record of the way they've been eaten by Australopithecines is entirely compatible with uh, the importance of, a, of, of wet um, habitats as providing key foods. Okay, so uh, my scenario of harmonization um, uh, based on uh, this inland delta here uh, in the Okavango as a model for the kind of thing that could happen in a variety of places is you have forest expansion, they get into a, a delta, there's a forest contraction, and now they have to adapt. And uh, they are able to adapt through maintaining a diet very similar to the one that they came from in the forest. They have ripe fruits for all year, but now they have to change in terms of their fallback foods. So some of them being even identical to those that are found in Kibali, um, but uh, increasingly uh, on uh, reliant on the kinds of foods that baboons uh, eat, uh, the sedges uh, like papyrus and uh, water lilies. So, uh, you know, this is a, an, a way of thinking about the adaptation uh, to um, a non-forest environment, which is different from the typical one. So the typical uh, arguments are that uh, there is a dry savanna that is important for um, the early Australopithecines. And the advantages of, of that in terms of uh, thinking about it are that um, dry uh, savannas would be relatively abundant. You've got savanna chimpanzees that go into them a bit, but in fact, they always depend on um, rainforest. And of course, there are most um, the use of savannas by hunters and gatherers, such as the Hadza and the Kung, uh, is in, in dry areas. But the alternative to think about is that the savanna is, is a wet savanna. Um, and admittedly, this is a much rarer habitat, but nevertheless, uh, it is extensively used by some people. Um, and um, in Australia, uh, the wet savannas um, appear to have been responsible for particularly high densities of uh, Aboriginal hunter-gatherers. Um, I think it's much easier to think about the USOs that are um, uh, nowadays used by people in both wet and dry savannas uh, as being accessible uh, relatively easily in wet savanna. 
in dry savannas, you've got to know a lot about what you're doing to be able to to find uh, the often um, heavily um, hidden um, tubers, uh, many of which probably do have to be cooked, whereas the aquatic plants are much easier to dislodge uh, and um, uh, to to eat uh, raw. Which is um, what baboons do, and here you see some baboons, uh, uh, one baboon walking bipedally uh, to, to get in there. Um, and um, I think everyone here is is familiar with the fact that uh, all of the apes are now known to uh, to wade bipedally, um, sometimes with the use of a, of a stick. It's a very rare case with gorillas, but uh, it's very impressive when this happens. So this would mean that access to these wet habitats uh, would have been available for these species. And I want to emphasize how much food there is available in these wet habitats. And by the way, uh, if you ever go to a survival manual, uh, when you're lost in, in an unknown area, uh, one of the first things they say is, go to the water. That's where you can predictably find food. Um, and uh, three types I'll draw attention to, the aquatic macrophytes, the, uh, the large plants that are actually um, uh, rooted uh, in water, uh, often with uh, floating leaves. And these are, are used uh, very widely. Um, water lilies are uh, known to be eaten raw uh, by many different people uh, all around the world. Uh, as you see here, and their densities are very often very high. So, uh, you know, as I walk around taking my dog for a walk, uh, I'm repeatedly seeing water lilies and thinking, uh, if um, uh, if I'm really hungry, you know, th that's where you go to find your foods, which is compared to just walking in the woods, uh, it, you don't know where to go and, and, and find anything that's edible. But with water worldwide, you do. Um, the rhizomes that uh, provide the food um, are strikingly non-seasonal in biomass, uh, at least in some species. So you will see that the, the leaves uh, are you know, absent in winter and uh, then they come in the spring and, and cover the ponds in, in the summer. But, uh, but you can find rhizomes all year. Uh, uh, as um, this particular uh, study uh, has been has been showing, um, <clears throat> they're uh, easily dislodged uh, by pulling. You just walk into the water and uh, and, and pull these things up. Um, so uh, uh, this is an example of a particular species that um, is. Um, uh, available as all of these are in, in relatively quiet water. Um, here you've got examples uh, in, in Australia. Um, the men, but more especially the women, wade in often breast high, pulling up stalks and roots. Um, turns out to be you know, very important foods for them. Um, here's uh, another place, uh, a young boys and girls spending the whole day wading up to their necks in water, uh, paddling about and swimming, gathering as many lily roots and stems and seeds as they can to devour. Um, and uh, similar sorts of things are known from a long way, a long time ago. Um, so at uh, this famous GBY site, Gesha Bennett Yakov, um, which was uh, discovered under the Jordan River when the Jordan was drained for a bit, uh, a almost 800,000 year ago site, so probably Homo erectus, so they don't have bones uh, from it. And uh, But lots of evidence of exploitation of um, foods that have to be collected from the water, uh, particularly this uh, lily relative, um, where they had hundreds of, of nuts um, that had clearly been recorded. And... Uh, uh, Nama Goraninba, who, who runs the site, went off to India and found a contemporary place where in India where 
uh, they have a very similar species and uh, saw people going into the water and collecting those things. So that's aquatic macrophytes. And then these semi-aquatic herbs, um, like papyrus and, and bulrushes or cattails, um, these uh, have a huge natural productivity. So um, here you've got an example, 125 dry tons per hectare per year, whereas uh, crops, uh, agricultural crops, are more in the range of 20 to 85 uh, dry tons for, per hectare per year. Um, so uh, these particular species are uh, seem to be enormously important. Again, gently rooted, uh, easy to uh, extract, um, with their bases in in the soft mud. And um, here you've got a case of the Australians, um, the Lower Murray region, one of the most densely settled Aboriginal areas of Australia. The main plant food was the bulrush root, uh, which was roasted year round uh, and uh, providing food for villages of up to uh, 500 people. The communal cooking ovens have, could have a, a, a ton of um, bulrush roots kicked at a, cooked at a single time. So this particular species was kind of like um, a potato. Uh, and in fact, the paleopathology of the people there indicated they were living at such high density with uh, so many um, calories from uh, this one species that they had a paleopathology reminiscent of uh, agricultural populations. So there you've got uh, bulrushes um, affording at all times a ready and wholesome food, the staff of life to the tribes inhabiting these morasses. So I think this you know, really helps to support the notion that these wet savannas are uh, potentially enormously productive. And again, rhizomes present all year, even though uh, they're most nutritious at the end of the growing season. But uh, they can clearly support these huge populations. And then you've got <clears throat> floodplain herbs um, where... Uh, they're growing in areas that are, are seasonally inundated. And um, uh, over the whole of, of Australia, uh, you had evidence of uh, people uh, collecting these uh, small bulbs. So this isn't necessarily related directly to um, the value of being able to wade in water, um, but it does emphasize, again, the amount of food available in these um these these wettest areas so <clears throat> okavango baboons um don't go very deep uh they eat rhizomes only in the uh, shallow water uh, according to the late dorothy cheney um and so if you can wade, then clearly this would give you the opportunity to go further into the water, collect some of these very abundant foods, um, and um, uh, up to maybe almost 1.5 meters, clearly advantageous. Um, so, you know, my perspective is that these shallow, these um, low energy water areas um, where you have a high abundance of foods, but basically because you've got water and you've got light. Uh, and um, when you have heat as well, these are the ideal growing conditions for foods. There are very few other animals that are exploiting these underwater roots. Um, you know, you don't have beavers in Africa. Uh, you basically uh, have nematodes, um, but uh, you know there are, there are no other species that are, are going for these species of um, plants. And so the concept I have is that uh, Australopithecines, then Homo, and even now today, have been enormously important. Exp um, these habitats have been enormously important for all of these species. So this just shows um, the mega deltas. Uh, in uh, some tropical areas. 
And in Africa, you've got the Nile and the Niger. And the Niger um, is enormously important. Uh, I think it's uh, reckoned that one in three sub-Saharan Africans is uh, from Nigeria. Uh, the density of people there is very high. And the density of people in all of these delta areas is very high because these are the most productive areas <coughs> of foods uh, for humans in general. I think one in 17 people in the world lives in the Ganges Delta. Um, the Nile has obviously uh, always been absolutely massive. And it seems to me quite reasonable to think that um, from something like uh, five million years onwards, that the density of our ancestors has been highest in areas like this. And of course, we know nothing about it because the ar archaeology is, is, uh, is gone. You don't have any archaeology uh, in the Delta areas to speak of. But um, when we think, when I think of um, the adaptations of our Australopithecines and Homo ancestors, I think of um, these Deltas as probably um, genetic and population sources, whereas uh, there'd be sinks uh, elsewhere. Okay, so that's food options outside the rainforest. And then <clears throat> what about the pros and cons of, of wading as a reason for bipedal locomotion? Well, kind of summarizing this. Um, <clears throat> the, the in favor of aquatic habitats as being providers of fallback foods, I've said it's a highly productive habitat um, and there's not many competitors. And all sorts of evidence nowadays indicates that uh, it's been important for humans. And it seems to me every reason to think that it's been important for Australopithecines too. The foods are relatively non-seasonal. We have the model with Okavango baboons of being a, uh, a fallback food and all sorts of human ethnographic models uh, as well. Um, it can produce these really dense populations, so the densest populations in the continent of hunter-gatherers, uh, Australia. And, um, and we see uh, human population distribution nowadays um, rising as you get near rivers um, and, and you know, being high on rivers. Uh, many agricultural areas are simply efforts to take rivers and expand the um, um, significance for uh, producing crops uh, away from the riverbank itself. So I think that aquatic habitats were likely to have been very important in supporting uh, early hominin populations. And I think of them as a key candidate component in Australopithecine ecology. Um, and Kevin Hunt, in his excellent book, Chimpanzee, um, from three years ago, uh, cites some of the uh, reasons for thinking of this um, leading to bipedal wading as a foraging adaptation. Um, so partly he's thinking about the, the way the um, cranial morphology and the dental morphology conforms to uh, what's needed for chewing these uh, roots. Robust faces and large molars, the pattern of dental wear, micro wear uh, fits nicely. And then the association of hominins with wet paleo habitats, um, not a very strong point because wet paleo habitats are where fossils tend to be found anyway, but nevertheless, it, it does fit. Um, and uh, and the, the lack of alternative fallback foods, which I've um, made a point more strongly elsewhere, I guess. And the fact that great apes do wade very readily. Um, and, um, in Africa, uh, I think you've got various plausible places. Um, I mentioned the uh, Nile and the Niger deltas. You've got some other uh, major marine deltas. These are all marine deltas. And then you've also got various <coughs> inland deltas. Um, and uh, I, I list them here. And so all of these could be places where during a forest um, expansion, um, a chimpanzee-like ancestor is deposited, and then during a contraction, uh, they um, either go extinct or uh, have a chance of surviving. And uh, play, location two is interesting because that's cl close to where Sahel Anthropus was found, and you know maybe Sahel Anthropus was had an independent uh, evolution 
in uh, that sort of environment, um, or maybe uh, it uh, had a evolution that actually led to <laughs> hominin hominization. So there are lots of opportunities. That's my my point here. But again, uh, against uh, these ideas, um, Matthew uh, Sponheimer um, said uh, the South African australopiths are, are more woodland associated than river associated. So you know, you've got to deal with that, and um, that uh, he was worried that the sedges were not sufficiently abundant uh, con in contemporary woodlands. Well, okay. He, like others, have made the point that um, there is a risk of predation. And, um, you know, that, that's something that needs to be dealt with. The fact that humans are often going into habitats that uh, potentially have uh, crocodiles uh, means that humans do have a way of figuring out how to, to do this safely. And I think part of it is that very often they're going into areas of water that are so thick with plants that um, the crocodiles uh, can't move very easily uh, to get there. But, but we need we need to know more about that. And he's worried that aquatic habitats are probably rather rare. Well, so were australopithecines. And you know, I'm I'm comfortable with the notion that australopithecines were really very river adapted, uh, in fact, low energy river adapted. In other words, uh, you know, really more deltaic habitats. And that um, around Africa, uh, during years, during periods when there wasn't a lot of rainfall, um, you could have Australopithecine populations that were quite isolated from each other, rather like hippos in different river systems. And then they would meet again during wetter periods uh, and uh, you'd have interbreeding and uh, then they'd... Um, uh, become more specialized uh, during the drier periods. Uh, Kevin Hunt, again, has his own uh, problems with bipedal wading as a foraging adaptation. Um, well, he said quadrupedalism, uh, you know, knuckle walking as it might be, uh, would put your hands closer to the foods on the water bottom. Um, but that's okay, because what humans do is they uh, can use their hands and feet, hands to pluck stems uh, which they're holding near the water, or feet to dislodge them uh, uh, down in the, in the soft mud. Uh, he says the buoyancy of the thorax means that there's not much need to adapt anatomically. And Dan Lieberman, my uh, colleague in Harvard, has made this point repeatedly to me when I try and persuade him that um, this argument could lead to uh, evidence of adaptation for bipedalism. So the, the point there is that facultative bipedalism would be good enough for wading. And, and we see, you know, the chimps, gorillas, orangutans, uh, bonobos, they all do wade pretty well. So what is it that makes it different? Uh, so what, what is it that would make bipedal evolution, as in Australopithecines, into more effective waders? Uh, it, could long legs be important? Uh, Kevin was also worried about um, foraging being dangerous, uh, given for hippos and crocodiles. And as I said, it may be that foraging would be restricted to areas where the growth of the plants is too thick for the dangerous animals to move easily. And Kevin said, well, no other aquatic animals uh, evolved bipedalism. Um, you know, the baboons just uh, carry on foraging uh, quadrupedally. Um, and uh, I'm wondering if uh, the ape ancestors were just exceptionally dependent on the aquatic foods. And it was, it was really important for them to be able to get these because unlike baboons, they don't have many other options. You know, baboons can depend quite a lot on, um, uh, on insects and uh, grass seeds and uh, other small items that they find in the drier savannas, but uh, chimps don't have those options. So um, the, the problem I want to leave you with is, um, is this one. Um, what evidence uh, can we assemble? What experimental evidence would be ideal, but of course it's difficult to imagine how to do it, um, to show which would be the better wader? Uh, chimps are already pretty good. Uh, can you imagine 
uh, pressures to make uh, a chimp-like body into an afarensis, um, which would be explained by afarensis being a better wader. And uh, by the way, in just in terms of the of the dimensions, um, here what we see is um, that uh, get rid of these things. Are these in your way? Can you? Oh, there we go. Let's go um, what I've done here is to try and put on the same scale um, the uh, um, bonobos and chimps from a National Geographic picture. And uh, this is uh, the smallest and largest australopithecine uh, afarensis um, that uh, are typically talked about. And so um, male, there was a big sexual dimorphism. Uh, this Lucy might have been a particularly small female, and this might have been a particularly big male, but nevertheless, there, there was a, a big difference, bigger than the difference in height between male and female chimps. So if we're just simply thinking about how far they could wade into the water, males would be probably better at it than, than females. So that raises a sort of questions about why wouldn't females... Why wouldn't it be advantageous for them to get taller and be able to go further into the water to get some of these precious foods? So um, this seems to me to be the question that uh, that those of us interested in wading as an evolutionary adaptation uh, need to think about. Do differences between chimpanzee and australopithecine morphology mean that australopithecines would be better forager waders? And I don't think that this question has really been examined properly. Um, so does it matter that uh, the bipedal posture of, of uh, Pan is relatively crouched? Does that make wading worse in some way? Um, the center of gravity is lower in uh, a chimp-like ancestor uh, than in australopithecines because of the long straight legs of australopithecines. Uh, does the higher center of gravity when buoyed up by water um, make wading more efficient? We want to know. Okay, so this is Fabian um, in Gombe. A nice photo by David Bygott, reminding us of the fact that if you have polio and, and can't easily walk quadrupedally, chimps can walk bipedally, and they can walk bipedally in water. So the question is, what is it that made them different, and did it really help? That's it. Wow, thank you very much, uh, Richard. That's fantastic. Uh, I, to coin a phrase, that was a wonderfully ecological argument for how we became bipedal, I think. And guess what? We need ecology. I yes. mean, I can't believe some of the papers that get written without ever thinking about what the darn animals are eating. Well, I have to, I have to admit, I'd never even thought of any of that. That's fantastic. So I, I've, got, I've got a million questions, but I, I'm, I'd, I'd like to offer it to... Uh, some of our uh, guests. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at Vernon and Simon in particular, hoping that, 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 that if you'd like to ask a question first. Simon, would you like to go first? If you could stop sharing your screen, uh, Richard, then we can sort of uh, get the gallery view. Richard, it's good to see you, and thanks for your talk. Hey, Simon. It takes me way back to the early days. <laughs> um. My question is... Um, is I'm, I'm, I haven't advanced beyond the Victorians. You look exactly the same. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. Yes, right. <laughs> I don't think you've evolved in that time. Um, just, just a note about why you don't talk about chimpanzees eating any kind of meat. You seem to have left that out. Yeah. In gut I anatomy also their gut anatomy must also be adapted to eating high protein foods such as meat and we need some explanation for how 
australopithecines and hominins managed to get larger brains. And we haven't really addressed that because eating more vegetation isn't necessarily going to grow your brain. And we're talking about a threefold difference between the brains of modern humans and chimps. Well, yeah, but I'm not talking about, about Homo. I'm talking about australopithecines. And I mean, their, their brains were barely bigger than chimps. The little they were bigger. Strong. They were bigger. They were maybe... 10% bigger, something like that. Um, um, yeah, so it's true. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, if, if you, I don't see why one would want to think about meat eating in that respect, particularly. Well, I wonder why you excluded it, because surely if you're wandering around in shallow water eating plants if you come across the odd shellfish or fish or meat then you're going to take it it's another source yeah, of okay but yeah i mean I'm, I'm totally cool with that and 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 they would have honey when they could find honey and um and occasional um insects but but those don't seem to be important on a daily basis you know the the i mean there are chimp populations that eat meat quite often. There are chimp populations that eat meat very rarely. Uh, very rarely meaning uh, the average individual two or three times a year. Uh, you know, and, and there are others where, I mean, Gogo famously, uh, they had a period of eating, you know, maybe 5% of their diet was meat. But, it, but, it, but, you know, what I'm thinking about is survival. I'm thinking about what, what you eat during periods when the chips are down, uh, which is the predictable dry seasons. And, and meat is not important then for chimps. You know, meat is a luxury item that uh, in uh, Gombe, uh, Kanyuara, and Ngogo have all been shown to be associated with um, high abundance of, of fruit. So it's when they have sufficient fruit available to be able to uh, engage in the risky uh, but rewarding behavior of hunting that they do it but but they don't do it uh, or they do it much less when they are up against it uh, in terms of uh, obtaining sufficient calories every day and the logic is that if they met, fail then they're really going to be hungry that night right thank you so, so you know, for for me, um, uh, australopithecines, who, who it's hard to imagine them being really effective hunters, uh, even you know, I, I mean, less so than chimps, yeah, you because know, chimps can, are so swift in the trees. Whereas australopithecines, you know, obviously they they must have, have um, slept in trees. Uh, I mean, that, that most people think that. Uh, they they climbed well. They probably got you know a lot of their food from trees. From um, they were good arm hangers and so on. Um, but um, uh, but I I can't think of them as as really effective hunters. Uh, so you know I, I I don't like the idea that uh, they were dependent on meat uh, in the way that um, humans came to be later. Thank you, uh, Ver Verna. Would you like to ask a, a question or make a point, and then and then I, I, I think Kim was next. Kim, if you'd like to go after that. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me all right? We can. Yes, yeah, nice so right. Uh, well, hello, Richard. Thank you for that lovely talk, and also, uh, it's uh, excellent that you've thought this thing through the way you have, and I think none of us. Well, certainly, I'd never thought it through in the way you have, um, looking at the rhizomes and tubers and... and uh, now, in Bodongo, which you didn't mention, <laughs> which I always do mention, we have rhizomes, but so uh, I'm thinking of Marantacloa uh, as a species. It doesn't actually grow in the swamps. It actually grows out in the forest, but it's near 
Uh, it likes water and it, it's near a river and near near swamp forest. And chimps do eat the pith of the Maranticloa uh, plum. And I think they occasionally you find a, a pith, that, a, a plum that's been pulled up and the tuber at the bottom of it, or a rhizome, I don't know which it is, has been eaten too. So, uh, yeah, they eat that food. But funnily enough, in Badonga, they eat it outside of an actual aquatic habitat. Now, going on to aquatic, I come to a question I have for you. And that is going back to John Oates' paper in 1976, where he looked at colobus monkeys going into the water to go for um, these kind of tubers and rhizomes. And he analyzed the content for minerals and found a high sodium content. And in our case in Bodongo, the chimps do go around a uh, swamp forest and they go and they make holes in the raffia trees and eat the pith, which has a high sodium content. So, um, in fact, the normal vegetation that chimpanzees eat, the normal fruits and leaves, don't have a high sodium content, they have a very low one. And um, I'm wondering whether you've looked at or thought of looking at or somebody's looked at the sodium content of some of these plants uh, that your Australopithecine ancestors um, might have eaten. Is, is that, would that have been another reason for them to, to eat them? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, I'm, I'm totally obsessed with salt, um, and I know you know I like your papers on on the, uh, the raffia. Um, I, so I I don't I don't know of anyone who has looked at the salt content of those those things. Um, I think of salt eating in in primates and humans as um, tremendously important, but um, it becomes really interesting when um, they target foods that are rich in salt, um, su such as rotten bark or rotten, rotten pith. And, um, and we have a species in Kibali uh, that uh, near Butonia, uh, which is equivalent of, of your Budongo one, uh, where the salt is accumulated uh, in um, stumps of dead trees. And apparently what's happening is that um, it's it's when the stumps grow in swamps, and then um, there is capillary action in which the water is coming up through the the uh, tree and evaporating and just bringing a little bit of salt uh, into the the wood, and and we find by the way you know not just chimps, um, but um, a, a bunch of different species of monkeys, the monkeys that don't eat insects. Um, will come and eat this same salt-rich wood, and so will um, some ungulates, um, butterflies, uh, you know, pangolins. Um, it, it becomes a source for all sorts of different things. But I think I think of the the salt getting as um, uh, associated with these rare foods, um, these rare sources. So we'll find out, you know. And and it's a, it's a great question. Do you know about the um, uh, the algal mats that um, uh, in Bosu the, the chimpanzees will uh, go into water and and use sticks, the extended sticks, and and pull yeah. the algal mats off the water and eat it. Okay, I'll I'll bet anyone hundred to one that that those are are um, high salt algae, uh -huh. um, and. Um, you know, so just like the water plants that the um, colobus are eating, documented by John Oates. Yeah, yeah. Yes, um, um, good, thank you. And uh, just to follow that along a bit, the dead wood idea, it comes up in Bodongo too. Um, we have uh, Clastopholis patterns, which uh, absorbs water from the ground when it, what the dead wood does, uh, when the tree dies and falls, uh, and uh, chimps actually uh, pull this dead wood out and chew it and spit out the pith and eat, get the salt. 
and they uh, and they sometimes go inside a dead tree because the bark doesn't decay as fast as the inside of that species, and they actually go right into the tree and they come out covered in bits of wood, which is no, fun. Yes. But yeah, sure. Now, in in other words, this is, is can we add this to your list of reasons for wading? Because it's at the edge of the swamp and in the swamp itself, that where there are trees, that they fall and um, imbibe minerals from the water. Assuming there are minerals in the water, this is also a good question. And I've often asked myself, why and how does the salt get in the water in the first place? Um, the best answer I managed to get out of um, Bodongo was uh, that the river Sonso, which runs through this, uh, the area we study, um, produces the swamp forest when there's a lot of rainfall. Sorry to go on about this, but it's the only way I've found of explaining it. Um, that river crosses over rocks before it uh, uh, reaches um, the forest and gets the salt from the rocks. So the river right. brings in... So if you if you can find um, uh, rivers which form these swamps or lead to swamps through flooding, and it, uh, you can perhaps trace the, where the source of the salt comes from. But anyway, that's a side issue. Anyway, I loved your talk. Thank you very much, and I'll stop. <laughs> hey, great to see you. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you, Vernon. Uh, so uh, next, uh, I've got uh, Kim. Uh, David, do you like to go next? You had your hand up earlier. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm Kim Waller. Uh, uh, Richard, thank you so much. Uh, I uh, uh, I have very little knowledge about dietary matters. Uh, my first question, I hope I'll be allowed to ask too. Uh, is uh, what seemed like a contradiction to me. I thought you said early that the reason uh, the this LCA ancestor would have been uh, eating primarily plant food was because of dietary conservatism. That is to say, I understood that to mean some type, kind of digestive limitation. And yet uh, uh, we've just acknowledged that uh, uh, under good circumstances, uh, you know, relatively high resource circumstances, chimpanzees absolutely hunt the colobus monkey. Um, and uh, and it's a prized food under those circumstances. Is there some re reason that they have difficulty digesting that? Uh, did you say, do they have difficulty digesting the, the meat? Yeah, the meat. Yeah. Well, um, it's not that easy for them. Uh, you do sometimes find lumps of meat in their feces um, and, and bits of bone and so on. Um, there was one famous occasion when <clears throat> a chimpanzee walked around with a hand sticking out of his anus uh, for uh, an hour or two um, because uh, the colobus hand had gone through his gut undigested and uh, was um, he, he couldn't quite squeeze it all out. Um, so it's... Uh, but but compared to humans, of course, you know the difficulty is that it's being eaten raw, um, and so we don't have a you know any kind of really direct comparison. Um, they the chimps uh, solve one of the problems uh, in a way that has never been proven by uh, any kind of experiments. But I'm I'm sure I I know what the answer is, um, because whenever they eat meat, they chew it up with. Uh, tree leaves and uh, people have often wondered if it's the chemistry in the leaves that's important but the fact that they don't make any choices among the leaves they just take whatever tree leaf is closest to them but not a herb leaf a tree leaf um, suggests that it's the physical structure of the leaf that's important and I've done some uh, informal experiments where um, after a well, during a party, uh, <clears throat> had a dozen people chew up um, raw goat meat uh, with avocado leaves um, and uh, and then spit out the results. Uh, and sometimes they chewed them with and sometimes without the leaf. And when they chewed it with the leaf, the rate of abrasion of the um, chunk of meat was much higher. Um, so it, it, I think it gives physical purchase 
uh, for them to be able to reduce the particle size much quicker. All of which is to say that um, they're not like lions, uh, which just swallow the meat and uh, and and you know really effectively digest it. They have to chew it up and uh, reduce the particle size, and still it's not necessarily um, very well digested. So, okay. you know, these are very informal answers, but I don't think anyone's got any kind of, um, you know, real physiological data. Uh, mm -hmm. on so, so I, continuing on the first question, however, so uh, well, human beings eat raw fish very effectively and seem to be able to digest it pretty well. So uh, what about uh, the option of, uh, of having a high protein diet? for a chimpanzee based on raw fish or for the LCA based on uh, on raw fish or or other kinds of seafood? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's hard for me to imagine how they would catch raw fish, catch fish, um, but uh, that's probably just my limited imagination. Um, if they could do so, then they would probably be able to digest them better than they can digest meat because mm -hmm. mammalian meat has got collagen, whereas you know, fish uh, have much less collagen, uh, thanks to the support of water. Um, and, and which is why humans are much better at eating uh, raw fish than raw mammal. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it is conceivable. Um, but, uh, but for me, the problem is that uh, what chimps need to do uh, is to eat a fair amount of food every day. And uh, the notion that they could be wandering along a seashore, uh, picking up enough edible items to be able to satisfy their daily needs, as opposed to um, providing a small luxury here and there. And that's the, that's the problem I have. Okay, you know, okay. the second question is a food supply. Yeah, right. no, no, the, I, I, I think I understand your reasoning. Uh, the, the second question I have it has to do with the lesser apes and the orangutans, uh, who, uh, whom you didn't talk about particularly. Now, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not an observational uh, researcher in the, uh, among uh, the lesser apes, but I've never seen one that, that didn't preferentially go bipedal on land. Um, and so uh, I, I'm, I'm sure you're aware that there is a hypothesis out there uh, that suggests that bipedalism actually originated uh, much farther back than the, the LCA that you're talking about, but rather an LCA with regard to all the apes. So what do you have to say about that? Well, um, I mean, the difficulty I have with that idea is that um, I, it, it seems to me very unlikely that uh, you have an independent origin of knuckle walking in gorillas and and Pam, the chimpanzee bonobo clade. Um, you know, if if bipedalism evolved prior to that point, prior to ten million years ago, in say the Asian African ape common ancestor, um, then we've got to say that uh, the bipedal um, ancestor, say, entered Africa. I don't know, twelve million years ago. Uh, and uh, evolved into separately into uh, the uh, another water, the gorillas and the, and the chimpanzees, but otherwise, and that just seems extraordinary. You know, they're, they're incredibly similar to each other. And only a few years ago, they used to be put in the same genus, yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, on all sorts of analyses, show uh, that uh, it's you know, very, very likely that they evolved from a common ancestor. And that common ancestor, therefore, would have been a knuckle walker. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank. Thank. Thank you. If 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 I might, uh, I'd like to ask a question. Um, it's it's um, just uh, a very a very good talk. Uh, th thank you, Richard. And and your ending, uh, which was very refreshing, to give the pros and the cons. I thought that's really it's really important to see weaknesses in whatever argument uh, you're favouring. And one of the one of the points you made there was, I think it was Kevin Hunt, you attributed it to, to suggest that just because the gorillas and the chimps uh, weighed bipedally, what, what what's the sort sort of selective pressure for that? And I've yeah. heard this argument before, and it just seems to me that uh, the point surely is that 
we're, we're looking for behavioural reasons to induce bipedalism. And Kevin Hunt wrote a lovely paper, I think, in sort of 79, 80, where he said, contexts that elicit bipedalism in extant apes uh, will offer clues as to the motivation uh, for the origin of bipedality. And it, and he did this study in, in uh, the Gombe, I think it was, uh, 700 hours of observations of chimps. And he found that they were most likely to be bipedal in trees reaching for food. And that led him to his kind of postural feeding hypothesis. But it seems to me that that's not really bipedal locomotion. It's kind of clinging, when you're clinging onto a branch with one hand, it's not moving, is it? And 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 if he'd have studied uh, the the bonobos uh, like you did, or like you like you went to to see the bonobos in in the Congo, and he would have uh, observed them w the context of wading, it would have. It, I'm sure he 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 might have come to with a different uh, answer to that question. Uh, and and the point about um, um, the uh, it not providing um, an a, an adaptation. I think can be uh, w uh, could be answered by studying the energetics of wading in different depths. I did a study, uh, you know, tw what, fifteen years ago, where we found that the 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 degree of knee flexion and the depth of water uh, was sort of um, uh, sort of proportional to uh, the, the benefit that you get uh, f from from um, from wading. So it takes the load off, but it's not black and white. So even in relatively uh, deep water, uh, there's still some cost. And so there's always going to be some selective pressure for bipedalism, even even in those situations. I just wondered uh, if you had any thoughts about that. Well, yes, my thought is go for it, you know, do it, do, do more. Um, because... Um... I, you know, because, because this is the problem. I mean, you know, Dan Liebman and, and Kevin Hunt are, are two uh, excellent functional morphologists, and and this problem worries them, and and so you know, it'd be fantastic to to do and th those kind of sound like ingenious experiments to to use humans walking at different depths, um, and by the way, it should be in mud and not in on swimming pools, um, to uh, to think about. Uh, the energetic costs or the risks of falling over or um, the ability to, to to be stable while tugging uh, you know I mean all, all of these sorts of questions the, you know the, the gorilla doesn't look, look too happy I mean it, it's using a stick and um, and they don't they don't wade too often um, so you know I, th I think we need to challenge we need to challenge apes but it's it, uh, you know, I understand it's incredibly difficult to do, but I mean, you know, to actually get chimps, which are presumably the easiest ones to work with, uh, into a, 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 a muddy environment where you're doing experiments and measuring things, you know, it's going to be a nightmare. But, but you're right, you know, that's what you've got to do. Well, thank you. Now, I, I'm just concerned about the time. How much time have you got, Richard? Uh, do, um, do you need to shoot off at any time? We're we're, we're now uh, half past. Uh, I, I, why don't we we give it until t another seven minutes, and then we can uh, all go home. Okay, so uh, let's have a quick one from Mons Gojata and then Kathleen. I think, uh, and 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 I think then we'll be we'll have to finish. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, uh, thank you very much for for this talk. This was uh, really amazing. I'm very happy that I could attend it. I'm not a scientist. I'm your humble. Uh, translator, what you actually were talking, so sorry if my question would be uh, silly. I also wanted to mention that what you are talking about conservatism in, in foraging, in feeding, uh, I think there is an intuition on this in Elaine's uh, uh, Descent of Woman, because what she says that you don't just simply decide to go out to Savannah and become a mighty hunter, and that's not what happens. So. I'm really happy to hear it from the, oh, from you know, evolutionary authority. Uh, I have a very simple question. Um, uh, not being a scientist, I would like to ask if wet savanna is a term. I mean, it's something that is widely accepted because you know, popular audience would think savanna is a dry savanna, but is wet savanna a term I could use in explaining things? 
Yeah, no, it's a good question. And I think the answer, uh, others may correct me, but I, I don't think it really is a term. And, it, you know, I, I, I want to make it a term, <laughs> uh, but maybe okay, it's not um, the right term. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, the important thing for me is to get away from the notion of a dry savannah. Um, yes, and, and, you know, because I think of these, the African populations that we think of as, as characteristic hunter-gatherers, you know, they are probably people who are living in the worst environments in, in Africa. Um, whereas if you were living in the Nile Delta, where mm -hmm. there's abundant plant foods and, by the way, abundant animal foods to respond to you know, Simon and others' points, that there'd be great opportunities for meat and fish and that sort of thing. Um, so the population densities would be enormously higher but you know these are, are not forest, and many people divide the habitats into two types: forest and savanna. You know, well these aren't forests. You know, and they're, they're not woodlands either. So you know, wet savanna, deltaic savanna, low energy water savanna, but you know maybe wet savanna can cover those. Yeah. Wouldn't it? Would, would, wouldn't it be accurate? Sorry, wouldn't it be accurate to call them uh, wetland microhabitats in in a broad savanna sort of macro habitat? Isn't that isn't that sort of yeah. like micro and macro uh, sort of habitats? Yeah, no, no, it's all right. It's not super catchy, but but accurate. Okay, yeah, so I have the, a, I have a opportunity to speak sometimes to to people who are not scientists. So I need really a phrase that kind of means something easily. And I would think that for these people, wet savanna is better than microhabitats. <laughs> I guess, forgive me. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Okay, so c c I'm 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 just concerned about Richard's time. So like, should we just finish with Kathleen? Have you got a question? Would you like you got your hand raised? Hello, Kathleen. Hi, yeah, um, I, I have two, well, just a comment and then a question. My comment is I thought the, a lot of people talked about nutrition and it seemed to me that the tortoise example was a strange one at, the, at an aquatic ape interested group just because it's true that there haven't been, turtles haven't gone from the sea back to the land. But of course, sea turtles came from the land. I mean, that's the evolutionary history of sea turtles. So that this is it's a very rich environment so the the one direction would be less likely than the other direction the the question i was sorry that mark for hagen was not here today because i'm not i'm a sociocultural anthropologist i'm this is not my specialization at all but i found his talk about australopithecus the possibility that australopithecines are in fact ancestral to chimpanzees and gorillas not humans i wonder if you've seen that if you have any thoughts about that? Because then that would make, if he's right, that would make this discussion irrelevant. Because he, his argument is basically, we have so few fossils anyway, we assume, you know, post hoc ergo proctor, like because the Australian scenes are there, they must be ancestral to us. And his argument is that in fact, they're ancestral not to humans. Have you seen that? Do you have a view on that? I'd just be interested to hear. I'm sorry, I haven't seen it. That sounds wonderfully counterintuitive um, and fun, but uh, yeah, no, I, but I don't know, so I'd, I'd have to look at that and think about it. I, I guess the, 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 the it, it draws on the idea that the last common ancestors was was somewhat bipedal, and uh, and the fact that most of the Australopithecines or all of the Australopithecines have got this uh, apparent bipedality. It's allowed. It's led to them all being placed in. in as relatives of hominins uh, or hominins and uh, as opposed to being chimps and, uh, and gorillas and and there are thousands of them aren't there but how many but how many chimpanzee and gorilla fossils have been found about two or three or something like that it just seems statistically implausible that every single one of these uh, fossils was all ancestor of homo and none of the gorillas and chimps i must admit i'm, I'm agnostic i'm a a agnostic on the theory but it just I think he makes a good case uh, for that. I mean, the thing about, about the forest apes is that forest is a terrible place for fossilization. Right. So, you know, it, um, it, it's, it's, 
it's not surprising that you don't find any chimp and well there's you know there's one chimp fossil okay well look, I, I i i want to sort of draw the line there thank you very much richard uh, if anyone can just join me thanking uh, richard for his thank time it's a wonderful thank thanks for great questions really fun to see everybody yeah um, mm -hmm. I'll, 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 it's, we, we have recorded this. I will send you a copy of the video for you to have a look at before we put it, put it online. Uh, but thank you again very much. And thanks, everyone, for for coming. And uh, it's a fascinating talk. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thanks a lot, Argus, for setting it up. It's great. My yeah. pleasure. Yeah.